of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God a work with that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We continue our study of the word of truth by extrapolating from it the doctrine of love which we now move into the fourth increment. And I don't apologize for this at all because this is one of the most important doctrines that you could study. Uh, I, I cannot overemphasize the importance of understanding uh, what love is and particularly the importance of the distinction between attraction love and unconditional love. There are many problem-solving devices, as you know, ten in all. Among the, these ten, the first two are particularly related, although you use them throughout all of your spiritual life, the first two are related to your your childhood as a believer, the second three are related to your uh, adolescence as a believer, and again, as I say, you use them throughout your all your life. But once you enter into spiritual adulthood, the last five problem-solving devices are absolutely fantastic. And I don't understand how any believer can get along without them. And in fact, I know the, uh, the believer can't get along without them. I have lived long enough and observed enough people to know that apart from understanding these particular doctrines, uh, the spiritual life of the average believer is uh, no different than the spiritual life of the unbeliever uh, that is uh, living by them, walking by them, working right by them. The first of the problem-solving devices, of course, as we've uh, we mentioned, is uh, attraction love for God. The second is unconditional love for all members of the human race. And that's, uh, these are the basic problem-solving devices related to spiritual adulthood. So I make no apology for uh, making this such a, it's such a long doctrine, uh, but it's so important. And only as you can understand it will you be able to uh, relax and enjoy your life. So in preparation for the continuation of our study of uh, the doctrine of love, let us, using 1 John 1, 9, if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ as well, let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gracious privilege of looking into your love and the love that is produced in us by God the Holy Spirit. May God, that, that same per third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, now teach us the things that are so necessary for our life and God-likeness, that we may exalt and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd help me to make it extremely clear as I communicate these things, as well as expediting the hearing of the believers who are listening, I ask in Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, we're about on point 12 here of the doctrine of love, and that is the pattern for our unconditional love, which is divine love. Now, there is an entire doctrine on divine love that is available to you if you want to, to just write and ask me, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of the doctrine of divine love. But for the purposes of our study of love, we're extrapolating from the entire doctrine of divine love the principle that God's attribute of love is the pattern for the believer's function in unconditional love. Where would you or I be today apart from the unconditional love of God? There's no question about the fact that God's unconditional love has bestowed upon us everything that we, we have. And because of that, 
and the fact that no matter who you are or what you are or what you do, you can never ever step out from under God's unconditional love. It's very, very important. So let's begin with the definition of divine love. God is infinite and eternal. All of his attributes must relate to each other and they can never contradict each other. God is sovereignty. God is perfect integrity, which is his absolute righteousness plus his justice, often referred to as his holiness. God is love. God is eternal life. God is omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, immutability, and veracity. Note God's love as one of these attributes of divine essence. Being eternal means that God's love is also eternal. And since God is absolutely perfect, God's love is perfect. Being immutable means that God's love also is unchangeable. It cannot under any circumstances be corrupted or changed because we fail or because we do anything in life. And because God is perfect integrity or holiness, God's love is always righteous and just. Since God always has been love and always will be love, God doesn't fall in love. And God's love is in no way subject to corruption. Because God is immutable, his love never increases, nor does it diminish. Therefore, lo God's love can't be changed by any form of human failure or any form of human vacillation. God's love exists with or without an object because it is a part of his character and unlike, which is totally unlike human love. I mean, love, God is love. And that's, a, that's an integral part of his essence. And therefore, whether or not he has an object is, is, is totally unimportant. And God's love is totally stable. It doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't discriminate. It doesn't respond to creature merit. Nor does it react to creature failure. This means, beloved, that God's love is not sustained by attraction the attraction of the object of his love, nor by rapport with the object of his love, nor by any worthiness of the object of his love, particularly we're talking about man. Man is spiritually dead, and his morality, human good, and self-righteousness doesn't impress God. And it is not a way of salvation. I'm sure you know that. God's love is virtuous since it can't be divorced from his integrity or any of the other attributes of his essence. This means that God being a holy, that is uh, one of his attributes, perfect integrity, because God is holy, God's love is perfectly righteous and just. And being virtuous, God's love is devoid of sin human good, altruism, or evil. It's free from hypocrisy or flattery or any form of patronization. There you have the definition of divine love. Now let's look secondly at the problem of man's spiritual death. When man became spiritually dead, there was no way that God with perfect integrity could ever have attraction love for spiritually dead man. There was absolutely nothing uh, in man that was attractive. The doctrine of absolute depravity teaches us that there is not, uh, as the liberals would say, a spark of good in everyone that God should love him. But from his divine essence comes the virtue of loving, sinful, spiritually dead mankind totally and completely without condition of any time. And since God is immutable, God never changes, his love never changes. Hence, God has unconditional love at all times toward all of his creatures. And because all three members of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, have perfect virtue, virtue, perfect integrity, perfect immutability, we can rest in this perfect, stabilized structure of love. 
So God's love is not going to change. Only after man believes in the Lord Jesus Christ is there a change. Not that he no longer loves us with an unconditional love. But you see, at the point of salvation, one of the 40 things that happens to every believer is that God imputes perfect righteousness, the per perfect righteousness of God himself, to the believing sinner. Now, this perfect righteousness being a part of the characteristic of this sinful, uh, spiritually now made alive man, though he has nothing attractive about him personally, yet the imputed righteousness of God is vitally important because now since man has been charged uh, or has, has had the perfect righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ charged to him, now God may not only love him with an unconditional love, but he can also love him with an attraction love. Before man can even be offered salvation, God loves him unconditionally, which is his motivation for providing perfect salvation. For God so loved the world, a world which was spiritually dead. That's unconditional love. Unconditional love has virtue in the subject only, God. God doesn't love anyone with an attraction love until after he believes in Christ and receives the perfect righteousness of God imputed to him. So that every believer has both unconditional love, as every member of the human race has, and also now an attraction love from God on the basis of his imputed righteousness. Now that sets up the divine love as a pattern for us. God the Father loves both God the Son and God the Holy Spirit with a perfect, infinite, and eternal love because they both possess perfect righteousness. God the Father also loves his own perfect righteousness. This is true also of God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. God the Son loves his own perfect righteousness and also has attraction love for the perfect Father and the perfect Holy Spirit. That attraction love for God the Father became God the Son's motivation for coming into the world in fulfillment of the plan of God. He was willing and obedient. As God, our Lord Jesus Christ, possesses perfect and eternal righteousness plus perfect and eternal love, this combination means that the Lord Jesus Christ, as God, resolves all the problems of his deity. The motivation of God the Father was unconditional love toward the entire human race, and that motivation resulted in doing something. I have said many, many times, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And so, God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely born son. God's unconditional love for all mankind though mankind was spiritually dead and in the state of total depravity, is demonstrated by the sending of God the Son into the world as our Savior. 1 John 4.10 says, By this love exists, not because we have loved God, but because He loved us, that's unconditional love, and He sent God the Son to be the propitiation or the satisfaction for our sins. It was not until our Lord Jesus Christ arrived at the cross and was judged for our sins that we see the tremendous dynamics of his unconditional love for all of mankind. He was judged for the sins of the entire human race, a totally unworthy object. Since the virgin birth, the first advent, and the incarnation, Jesus Christ is also true humanity as well as undiminished deity combined in the hypostatic union. The humanity of Christ was filled with God the Holy Spirit during his first advent. From the source of Bible doctrine, our Lord in his humanity had perfect spiritual maturity. He never lost his poise. He never lost his sense of destiny during the first advent. He was motivated by perfect attraction, love for God the Father and for the plan of God the Father. Therefore, he was motivated to go to the cross and bear our sins in his own body on the tree, 1 Peter 2.24. His motivational virtue is expressed in several places, Matthew 26-39, Mark 14.36, and Luke 22.42, when he said, 
Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ had perfect unconditional love for all of those who maltreated him and maligned him during the seven trials and the resultant crucifixion there at Calvary. His unconditional love was expressed in picking up his cross. So we are commanded to pick up our cross and carry it, meaning that we are to function under unconditional love. Now let's put all these three things together. The definition of God's divine love, the problem of man's spiritual death, and divine love as our pattern now comes out in the application. Just as God has unconditional love for all mankind, so the adult believer has acquired unconditional love for all mankind through the momentum of spiritual adulthood. Not just from the source of the filling of the Spirit plus from doctrine, but plus this from the source of doctrine, but from the doctrine applied when we go through suffering for blessing. When God is the subject and the believer is the object, God has perfect attraction love because the believer possesses God's perfect righteousness, as I already taught you, by means of imputation. This means that now we have a stronger position with God than ever before. He has put in our lap an absolutely fantastic plan that brings us things that stagger our imagination. God's attraction love for all believers results in the provision in time of equal privilege and equal opportunity for the fulfillment of the, and the execution of the plan of God. God's justice now daily imputes to the divine righteousness in us our logistical support. Every day we need support and God provides it for us. Every day we need support to stay alive in the devil's world. It makes no difference what the historical circumstances, in what era you live, you cannot be removed from this earth until the sovereignty of God says so. And even when you sin, beloved, God still loves you with an attraction love because you still have and you can never lose the imputed divine righteousness which belongs to God that has now been charged to your account. God has provided a way for believers as human subjects to function under unconditional love and to advance in and execute his plan. He has also provided us with uh, attraction love, I mean with, with the, uh, the love that comes from because of, of our attraction, after our attractiveness to him from the source of our imputed righteousness to be sustained and kept alive to fulfill the plan of God for our lives. Now, I, I am amazed at how few people understand this. I was reading in the paper just recently uh, on the religious religion page of our local paper a discussion regarding uh, the uh, existence of purgatory, uh, saying, uh, pointing out that many Catholics uh, no longer. Uh, want to believe it or admit to such a doctrine. Uh, and uh, perhaps I should explain that the doctrine of purgatory uh, is misunderstood by many people, but purgatory uh, means that uh, people who are believers uh, uh, cannot get directly into heaven because there are, they have too much sin within them, and so they are... Uh, uh, they have to go through a time of the purging of their sins. And uh, this article goes on to point out that many Protestants are now, while not using that term, are, are saying that believers have to do this. In fact, one, even, one I guess he's an evangelical, uh, is quoted as saying that there is a kindergarten heaven for us. Oh, how absolutely stupid. They do not understand the doctrine, uh, the doctrines of soteriology, uh, salvation, and they do not understand the doctrine of imputation. Uh, we do not get to heaven because we are righteous. We will never get to heaven because we are righteous. We get to heaven because by faith, through grace, we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and God has imputed his divine righteousness to us so that today we stand accepted in the beloved one and therefore nothing can change that. 
So we have unconditional love from God as members of the human race. And we have uh, attraction love from God because of the divine righteousness which has been charged to our account. So matter, no matter how unrighteous we may be or how unattractive we may be in our experience, it never changes the attraction love for God because his love for us in the attraction phase is not based on us either. It is based on the imputation of that divine righteousness to us. Now with that as a background, we proceed with this application by looking at point 13 in the doctrine which says human interaction demands problem-solving devices. Let's look first of all at attraction love and personal hatred. Now, talking now not about God's relationship with us, but our relationship with one another, human rela interrelationships. Human uh, interrelationships point out that there is an instability in attraction love, and this causes many, many problems. Some of these are self-induced, that is, problems of conflict and antagonism, arrogance and jealousy, guilt, self-pity, hypersensitivity, disorientation, marital problems, interaction problems, problems with people, problems with yourself. More people are motivated and manipulated by guilt than almost anything else. Now, when we quote unquote fall in love or when we come to the place where we like someone very much regardless of who they are we are usually involved in an attraction love uh, there is this uh, there is a physical uh, eros kind of love that God doesn't even talk about in the word of God which is totally physical eros by the way is the uh, Greek uh, for the uh, for Cupid same, same one. Cupid and Eros are the same, and uh, we just recently celebrated a period of, uh, of time in which Eros was exalted, uh, or Cupid was exalted. This kind of a love is uh, attraction. And, and it's a very wonderful kind of a love when you can have someone who is attractive. But uh, as we'll point out, even as this doctrine continues, nobody is going to be attractive all of the time. They may move from a, being attractive to unattractive in a moment of time. And if you're depending on attraction love to perpetuate a relationship, you are headed for total and complete disillusionment and the destruction of that love. Furthermore, attraction love in romance is the producer of jealousy, vanity, bitterness, hatred, self-pity, implacability, guilt, and revenge. For example, falling in love with a member of the opposite sex is most often a matter of libido. That's eros. Being attracted to someone or being motivated by libido is devoid of virtue. There's no virtue. Libido is all too often devoid of even conscience and is therefore minus virtue, minus integrity, without a sense of respons responsibility. Libido is selfish and self-serving. It wants to be satisfied in itself. And uh, looks upon the, the person whom you love becomes the object by which you can satisfy the libido in your, in your own uh, uh, soul. For this reason, attraction love in romance or marriage has no stability and no perpetuation. Therefore, when the object of your love becomes unattractive, you then are going to have some real problems, and these will be outlined later in role model arrogance and iconoclastic arrogance when we talk about that. But attraction love minus the virtue of unconditional love to provide the capacity often reaches its peak at the altar or shortly thereafter and from there on marriage is really a mockery. Two people cannot consistently live together. I don't care who they are or where they are over a long period of time apart from having unconditional love undergirding the, uh, the uh, attraction love unless there is total sublimation. I uh, uh, was watching my tape, uh, uh, taped program 
of uh, the Letterman Show in which he had as his guests a couple that had been married for 74 years. And uh, these uh, people, and you know, the unbeliever can have a measure of happiness uh, in, in his married relationship. Solomon tells us that this is a possibility. But uh, they, she uh, did all the talking and uh, that perhaps tells us exactly what happened. Uh, you can sublimate or you can switch. If you don't have the production of unconditional love in your soul by the doctrine plus God the Holy Spirit's filling, then sublimation is the only thing you can do. You simply swallow it. And there are some people who can for 75 years or more swallow the, the fact that their mate is unattractive in order to, quote, get along, in order to uh, meet the, the mores or the standards that they have developed in their lives. It's very possible to do this. And uh, you, it, sometimes it produces other things, uh, rashes, uh, uh, ulcers, uh, uh, colitis, uh, many other things uh, uh, will, uh, can be caused when a person sublimates the fact that the person whom he loves has become unattractive. On the other hand, if you have the filling of the Spirit, the control of the Holy Spirit, and you understand unconditional love, it is possible under circumstances and situations like that to be able to switch from attraction love to unattraction love. Attraction love actually complicates life by combining the problems in two people, an amalgamation which intensifies their stress in life. The weakness of attraction love for another is based on the existence of too many factors necessary for its success and its perpetuation, namely the perpetuation, the continuation of the attractiveness of the object. And I don't care how wonderful that person may be, at certain times in their lives they are very attractive. But there are other times in their lives in which they are downright unattractive, if not repulsive. And uh, uh, you heard the old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, I used to joke around uh, uh, that by saying that when you first meet me, you don't like me. After you get to know me, you hate me. Well, uh, that uh, may or may not be true uh, of, uh, of me, though I suspect it may well be. Uh, the principle is that familiar, the more you know about a person, there are more things that you will find in that person to dislike, to, uh, to destroy the rapport, to destroy the attraction love. And then, when you love someone with an attraction love and there's no reciprocation, they don't love you back. This intensifies your frustration. It causes disillusionment and results in reaction which causes the person to concentrate on the flaws rather than the things that formerly attracted you. You loved this person. There were certain things about them that you were attracted to. Now they have rejected your love. And having rejected your love, you've become disillusioned, frustrated, and now you're looking for things that are wrong with them so that you can tear them apart. This is the iconoclastic part of the area. Because I'll be dealing with this in more detail in one of the, uh, the future points in the doctrine of love. But this produces fantastic pressures that come from human antagonism, hostility, animosity, and it demands that there must be a problem-solving device for this to function. You've got to be able to be able to, to counteract attraction, love, romance, and friendship uh, problems with a problem-solving device. And of course, the problem-solving device is the function of unconditional love on the part of the spiritual adult. Wrong priorities and wrong emphasis in life results in the believer manufacturing his own problems, but he has no problem-solving devices to cope with life. Inevitably, the believer with no problem-solving devices becomes a casualty in life gets all of his kicks from sublimation, avoids reality, becomes divorced from reality, and often becomes psychotic or neurotic. There must be an original love as a problem-solving device. Otherwise, 
you're handling attraction love and the failure of attraction love in the wrong way. In suffering for blessing, in which you receive what Paul calls insults and persecutions in 2 Corinthians 12, you must have unconditional love. This is a part of, of people testing. It's a part of systems testing. Three, out of, three of the categories of testing require unconditional love. People testing, system testing, and thought testing. In his testing, Job, in his spiritual maturity, only succumbed and failed when he listened to his three friends who gave him wrong doctrinal application. So, even in testing, when you're in spiritual maturity, unconditional love is the solution. You're, you're the victim of a rotten system, and usually a rotten system is related to rotten people. Uh, and uh, uh, the jerks, and, and uh, uh, there are multitudes of jerks in life. And uh, you're going to run across them. And the jerks are part of the people testing. And, and uh, it may be people you meet casually, maybe people you work with, maybe people who are members of your family. It may be people, uh, members of the family you marry into. You can't control those things, of course. It may, be, it may be the person you select in marriage. But you must, they become a people testing and produces thought testing. Now, in your thought testing, you go through the thinking process. And you are either going to come up with mental attitude sins or you're going to be able to have, under the filling of the Spirit, the ability to switch to unconditional love. You have no permanent, stable solution to the problems of human relationship until you come to your, spir your spiritual growth, to spiritual adulthood. And in that period of time that you're growing, you may have a taste of unconditional love until someone stronger takes it away. But basically, until you reach spiritual adulthood, the best you can do is fall back on confession of sin and faith rest technique. That's all that's there. But once you reach spiritual adulthood and you are more consistently controlled by God the Holy Spirit, you will be able to switch. You will recognize immediately when it is necessary and it will be possible for you to switch to unconditional love. Unconditional love is a problem solver in the antithetical categories of human relationships. It's a problem solver for love and hate, for friends and enemies, for admiration and animosity. Unconditional love means that you have virtue, a problem-solving device, and you're able to handle people honestly, justly, and fairly. Therefore, you have the ability to have a very happy love relationship because though you're both imperfect, unconditional love gives you the ability to handle the inevitable problems that come. And it doesn't make any difference if the person you love has unconditional love for you. You don't, it doesn't, it isn't necessary. You can be in a relationship in which that person does not share a love, does not express a love for you. And you can switch to basic impersonal love and relax in life. Furthermore, not only in the close relationships of life, but also in uh, uh, the, uh, the, the object of unconditional love can be known or unknown. Maybe a friend or an enemy. The person may be beautiful or ugly, attractive or repulsive, honorable or dishonorable, good or evil, a believer or an unbeliever. Unconditional love is the resource that you can use consistently. Unconditional love is not corrupted or cannot be corrupted or deceived by flattery, human approval or approbation, emotional rapport, or the exploitation of arrogance and personal ambition. Unconditional love can't be destroyed by hatred, by persecution, by, by unjust treatment, by vindictiveness, or any category of antagonism. Why does the Bible command you never to go to court over slander? Because there is no unconditional love when you are motivated by revenge. But 
you're to put it in the Lord's hands, leaving it to the Supreme Court of Heaven, which is switching to impersonal love. Unconditional love, beloved, is even obvious in the Lord's Supper. Our Lord himself demonstrated unconditional love when he went to the cross and was judged for the sins of the entire world. The bread and the wine recall to mind both the virtue of our Lord's humanity in his divine dynasphere. The bread reminds us of our Lord's attraction love for God the Father, the author of the plan. The cup reminds us of our Lord's unconditional love for all mankind and his bearing all of our sins in his own body on the tree. He didn't want to go to the cross, but he was obedient because he had attraction love for God the Father. And he received the judgment for all of our sins because he had unconditional love for all mankind. This is absolutely fantastic. So human interaction demands the problem-solving devices of attraction love. And we have now looked at attraction love and personal hatred. Let's now look at a very important subject under this human interaction. Sensitivity versus hypersensitivity. Oh, beloved, let me tell you, here is a problem of relationship with people. Every person in a relationship with self has an area of vulnerability. If you are sensitive about what people think of you, then you will become hypersensitive in relationship to arrogance, and that hypersensitivity is directed toward yourself. You then will be insensitive to the situation, to the thoughts and the feelings of others, and you become thoughtless, rude, indifferent, and cruel with mental attitude sins. Whenever your area of vulnerability is touched, you lose your self-esteem, your self-confidence, your poise, and you react to the person or persons and the environment that produced this. And reaction is hyper, in hypersensitivity results in loss of virtue. You no longer love God nor have unconditional love for mankind. Sensitivity is the manifestation of unconditional love and its problem-solving capacities in three areas of relationship, with God, with others, and with self. Unconditional love is characterized by being sensitive to the feelings of other people. The expression of thoughtfulness, courtesy, good manners toward others, the willingness to accommodate oneself to an individual or a group of individuals, whether it's in business, in social life, in spiritual life, in your interpersonal relationships, in marriage, being sensitive to the, the, the person who uh, you are to love. You, you understand them. Maybe you cannot uh, enter into all of their feelings with empathy, but at least you can understand that they have those feelings. And in being sensitive to those things, you are able to adjust by means of unconditional love. Sensitivity toward others is the function of thinking as an adult believer. It's part of spiritual maturity. And uh, the basis for this, of course, is your own personal genuine humility with the addition of unconditional love. Uh, now you are sensitive to uh, the feelings to the circumstances, to the situations of others. Sensitivity is invisible, but very dynamic when you are put under pressure from the very same people who are uh, causing problems for you. But you understand that as they are causing problems for you, it's because there are problems that in, their, in themselves that they do not understand and do not adjust to, and they are perhaps taking it out on you because they don't even have any confidence or love for themselves. But once you become sensitive to other people by means of the power of the Holy Spirit and unconditional love, 
in your spiritual maturity, you can handle people testing. You can handle the rotten systems testing. You can handle thought testing. And here's a test. You can always tell when you're failing the test, when you become hypersensitive. Now, what is hypersensitivity? Hypersensitivity is based on arrogance, just as sensitivity is based on humility. Hypersensitivity is the arrogant preoccupation with yourself. And it distorts human relationships into a system of self-manufactured suffering and misery because of the fact that you consider that other people are there to make you happy. No one ever, ever has been designed to make you happy. You must understand that. Here's an illustration. Take marriage. Marriage has three problems. I, you, and we. All right? If I am hypersensitive, then you will find it very hard to please me. And you will find me very unstable. If you are hypersensitive and I am thoughtful, my thoughtfulness is totally wasted because we will just never get along because of your hypersensitivity. So there you see, I, you, and we in marriage. But this is, this is true in any relationship with people. If I am hypersensitive, you will find it difficult to please me. If you're hypersensitive, then uh, there's nothing I can do to please you. No matter what it is. Hypersensitivity injects self as a false issue into every relationship in life. Self is involved in relationships, but the issue should always be true issues and not false ones. And self interjected is a false issue. Hypersensitivity seeks to control people as the, the, this is the arrogance of the weak trying to control the strong. But if you're hypersensitive, you are always trying to, co to control other people. Obsessed with the arrogance of self-importance, hypersensitivity superimposes unsolicited advice and opinions on others and thus violates the privacy of those in one's periphery. One of the things that you will see as this, we can continue with this doctrine in future studies is that uh, unconditional love respects the privacy of the priesthood. My son John was telling me the other day that in uh, the discussions of the so-called merger of the previous uh, 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 congregation in Fort Wayne, the criticism of me was of too much emphasis on the privacy of the priesthood. <laughs> well, I wear that as a badge of honor. I consider that the greatest compliment that they could pay for me. And whether the new and some of the old congregation agreed with that statement is irrelevant and immaterial. As far as I'm concerned, God agrees with me. And if, uh, he'll show me someday if I am wrong. But I definitely, a person who is obsessed with his self-importance, his own hypersensitivity, loves to tell other people how to live their lives and what they must do and always violates their privacy. While wearing their feelings on their sleeves, the hypersensitive people are insensitive to others. It's amazing how the arrogance of hypersensitivity is totally sensitive to the opinions of others around him about himself, and yet he's totally insensitive toward others. He cares what other people think about him, but he cares nothing about those people themselves. He's sensitive to their criticisms, insensitive to them. And when he is confronted with Superiority, hypersensitivity, seeks to destroy it. When confronted with inferiority, hypersensitivity seeks to bully it and to dominate it. Hypersensitive believers are basically unteachable. They always make an issue out of themselves rather than a content of Bible doctrine. 
this negative volition toward doctrine will eventually sponsor self-induced misery because they make themselves misery, miserable instead of utilizing Bible doctrine. I don't know how many people okay, in my congregations down through the years okay, have re reacted to what I'm teaching. And this uh, is brought out also in the doctrine of spiritual decline, which we're teaching in the other class, uh, almost the same simultaneously with this study, in which uh, a person hears the Bible doctrine and uh, rather than taking it from God, takes it as a personal attack from the source of the communicator and reacts against it, entering that person immediately into spiritual decline by means of mental attitude sins. That's hypersensitivity. Make an issue out of themselves uh, rather than doctrine. Uh, like uh, the fellow who came into my office one Monday said, were you talking about me in yesterday's message? Well, that should never have occurred to that person if he were in fellowship and not hypersensitive. As a result, he and his wife eventually left and went on to uh, better, better churches, better churches than what I had. Hypersensitive believers can't achieve spiritual adulthood in the plan of God. They can't attain unconditional love. They're hopelessly entangled in disciplined suffering because hypersensitivity and mental attitude sins produces divine discipline and therefore they're entangled in that disciplined suffering and that suffering is from their own making and they become aggressors with which mature believers must practice their own conditional love they become our test God doesn't take them out of our lives all the time sometimes they move on to other, <laughs> other better churches but sometimes they stay with us and they become our test Believers who are mature must practice unconditional love when dealing with hypersensitive people like this. Now, remember this. The person who controls your life controls your happiness unless you control your life in the plan of God. In attraction love, the object of your love controls your life and becomes the custodian of of your happiness. That person, when, when everything is going well, right? When everything is going great, and that person is extremely attractive, life is tremendous. You're walking on cloud nine. You're in love with love. Uh, love, love, you know, that kind of a thing. Then, um, if that person withholds the attention, if that person withholds love to you, if that person rejects you, immediately the bubble bursts and you fall to the earth and now you are extremely unhappy. unhappy. They have controlled your happiness by whether they are attractive or unattractive. In personal ob uh, antagonism or animosity, the object of your antagonism controls your life and your happiness. When they are unattractive, when they are uh, antagonistic toward you and you're reacting to them with mental, atti mental attitude sins, you have destroyed your own happiness. If you switch to unconditional love, they can't take your happiness away. So here's the principle. If you surrender the control of your life to someone else, anyone else, your mate, your mother, your father, your children, your boss, your, your associates, if you surrender control of your life to anyone else through attraction, love, or antagonism, you're going to blame that person for every bad decision you make and for the unhappiness which results. Therefore, you destroy your relationship with yourself through divorcement from reality because that is not the case and failure to take responsibility for your own decisions. Remember this, beloved. Your happiness must not depend on others. But this can't be avoided unless you have unconditional love from Bible doctrine and the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. And finally, under the point 13, maladjustment in relationship to yourself. The lack of regulation of your emotional life by subordinating it to, uh, uh, by failure to subordinate it to the intellect results in imbalance instability and ego sensitivity or egocentricity. Let me say that again. The lack of the regulation of your emotional life by failure, and there's a mis there, there's some words left out in your notes on this 6A, 
okay, or uh, should be uh, F.A. Uh, failure, lack of regulation of the emotional life by failure to subordinate your emotional life to your intellect, which is, should be controlled by doctrine, results in imbalance, instability, and egocentricity. In normal persons, the mentality knows if the emotional responses are adequate or not and is able to maintain a sound balance so that emotions are used for enjoyment of thought. The action of this regulating factor is diminished or abolished in abnormal persons. He lacks the ability to realistically evaluate the object of his emotional reactions. Drive toward a false object becomes so intense that reason no longer governs one act, one's actions. You know, these a obsessive personality types, uh, compulsive personality types. This person uh, uh, loses all objectivity, intellectual reasoning abilities, and he pursues the false object with pseudo-love or hatred fanaticism. And once you become vulnerable to your own emotions, you have cut off reality in your life. You become unpredictable. You can never trust that person. He's preoccupied with self-gratification. His love or his friendship may last only so long as it is to his advantage. Now, we will see this in the, in the other class when we come down to the emotions taking over the soul in the stages of spiritual decline. So, beloved, it is so important that we understand human interactions will demand problem-solving devices. Now let's turn to Roman numeral 14, problems that result from the lack of unconditional love. Since unconditional love is a major problem-solving device in the Christian way of life, and it only comes through spiritual growth, the importance of consistent study and application of Bible doctrine becomes evident. Bible doctrine must constantly be circulating in the soul. This means that the rate of learning must always exceed the rate of forgetting. Now this implies two problems. First of all, distraction from Bible doctrine results in forgetting what you have learned. And you can't apply what you have, do not know or have already forgotten. Secondly, you can't cram for a problem by trying to learn the whole realm of doctrine in one day or in one sitting. The believer must pace himself on a regular, consistent basis with regard to learning doctrine so that the continuous rate of learning will exceed the rate of forgetting. In the final stages of spiritual decline, the rate of forgetting doctrine exceeds the rate of learning doctrine. The stages of reaction, the frantic search for happiness, emotions taking over the soul, locked in negative volition, hatred for truth, turning against the things you formerly loved, and apostasy. These are the stages of spiritual decline, and we're talking about them in our, in our other class. But uh, all of these cause, and you, you see people may still attend Bible class, but the rate of forgetting exceeds the rate of of advance or the the adva the the, the uh, of learning. Many of the problems of the Christian way of life are the result are of either ignorance or malfunction of unconditional love. And no believer can execute the plan of God and glorify God, nor account for his thoughts, motives, or actions in ignorance of doctrine. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is the disaster of the Christian way of life. So I cannot lay uh, uh, any greater emphasis than that upon the regular, consistent taking in of Bible doctrine. And again, if you can't take it in by face-to-face -face teaching, the availability of tapes and books and Bible doctrine materials uh, is uh, at least taking it in. Now, let's look secondly at the problem of unrealistic expectations. Problems resulting from the lack of unconditional love. Unrealistic expectations. Beloved, very few people are loved the way that they want to be loved or treated the way they want to be treated. Because of this, people develop subjective arrogance. This interposes frustrations which distract from doctrine 
destroys the true focus of the Christian way of life, which is occupation with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This, in turn, destroys human relationships, whether it's marriage, romance, or friendship. As long as people react to others who do not love them the way they want to be loved, it is impossible for any virtue to exist. This inevitably leads then to putting your eyes on yourself, eyes on people, eyes on things. This focus is substituted for your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is occupation with Him. Eyes on yourself is arrogance, which makes you selfish, self-centered, and totally unacceptable. Eyes on people is lust. This is where you become frustrated by comparing yourself with others, thinking that others are getting better treatment than you are, and are the recipients of a better category of love. You look at another marriage and you say, well, look at how happy they are and how unhappy we are. Look at what uh, I could have had had I married uh, Charlie Brown or, or whoever. Eyes on things is covetousness. These three categories result in sins related to arrogance. That's why people in relationships with other people become jealous or bitter, become implacable and turn to self-pity, why they slander and malign other people. This explains lasciviousness, inordinate ambition, and inordinate competition coupled with the destruction or distortion of love in the human race. Well, before getting into the discussion of role model arrogance, uh, iconoclastic arrogance, and uh, uh, the, uh, some of the other principles related to this, uh, I'd rather stop at this point uh, and uh, pick it up in our next study. Now, thank you, loving Father, for your matchless grace and all that your grace provides in teaching us the, this wonderful doctrine of unconditional love and providing for us the means whereby we can switch to impersonal love, to unconditional love, to a love which is produced by God the Holy Spirit rather than a love which is based on attraction and attraction alone. Thank you for the fact that you love us both with an unconditional and an attraction love because of who and what you are and what you've done for us. Thank you that we can never get out of these relationships that is ours and ours forever. Help us to apply this principle to our relationship in life with other people, I ask in Jesus' precious name.